So the plan for today is to, I will cover logistic regression, which some of you already had, uh, uh, some of you encountered yesterday in your practical. Um, today I will explain it properly, um, so that people that do the practical tomorrow will uh, hopefully have an easier time. Um, and next week uh, we will use the same practical, because I realized that I was giving you a topic that was uh, not yet covered in the lectures. The focus though was for you to start playing with it and look at the optimization packages. Um, but next week um, you will go over that practical again and hopefully you will finish it including the, the optional options. Um, okay, so so far, we've been doing mostly type of uh, function approximation networks, which you, where you do sort of regressing, where you're trying to sort of map inputs there to outputs, and the output is a continuous variable. Now we're going to do something that's categorical. Um, in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to take inputs, and we're going to put uh, to decide whether the inputs are of one class or the other. So we're going to uh, discriminate between things. Um, so, good examples of this is um, trying to predict whether someone um, has a disease or not. Trying to predict whether you email, your email is spam or not spam. And in fact, that's a very good example because if it wasn't for a classifier there that decides whether your email is spam or not, we would all be inundated with spam. So, it's definitely a nice place to you know, it's one of those really nice applications of machine learning. But classifiers really are in everything, everything. Most of the services you use on the web behind there is a classifier. Um, that's always learning from the behavior, um, your behavior. And among those cl classifiers, I think the most popular one is definitely logistic regression. It's by far the simplest one. Um, um, but it's extremely powerful. You can implement it at a very large scale. As we will see in today's lecture, the optimization, uh, the, the objective function is convex, so we can optimize it easily. Um, there's, you know, we can optimize it very efficiently. We can run logistic regression with many, many features, many inputs. Um, and so this is something that uh, most internet companies use routinely all the time. This is sort of like a workhorse um, um, everywhere. If you need to classify web pages um, to be able to detect uh, web pages that are spam, if you need to do any of these sort of tasks where it would just be impossible for humans to do, uh, be able to decide whether tweets are saying something positive or something negative about Obama. Um, you know, doing things at such a scale uh, of data would not be possible without this technique. And, and, and this is routinely used by Twitter, by Google, by all sorts of big companies um, out there. Um, so we're going to cover this model. Uh, we're going to see how it works um, in this lecture. Um, so in particular, how we formulate its likelihood, just like we did for linear regression. Uh, we're going to uh, look at the gradient, we're going to look at the Hessian, and we're going to try to uh, write it um, in, in, in two different ways. One that uses this thing called the logistic function, which I will introduce soon, and something else called the softmax function, which you probably encounter in your practical, or, um, or will encounter it tomorrow. Um, and that's the way Torch implements it. So we're going to see how Torch um, that's this implementation, but I will do that in the second lecture after this one, where we're going to go through the um, how would you efficiently implement logistic regression, and especially if you're thinking of how to do it for, uh, uh, if you're thinking of how to extend it to much larger neural networks. Okay, so. Um, from a biological perspective, logistic regression is inspired by a very simple model of a cell called the McCulloch Pitts model of a cell. Um, and in this simplistic view, you have some, a cell has some synapses. Um, other cells pass information to this cell via the synapses through action potentials. Um, and then the cell eventually fires um, some 
action potentials uh, along the axon to the next cell. So the, the, the sort of very simplified model of the cell um, is that you have several inputs uh, from 1 to D. Um, each input gets uh, multiplied by a parameter, so it's just like linear regression, and then you sum them up. Okay, so up to here we've just done linear regression. Um, the next thing is we're going to put them through the squashing function, uh, through this gate function called the sigmoid. And what a sigmoid does is basically um, when the value of the input xi theta is above a certain threshold, the cell fires. So the output is 1. Uh, when it's below a certain value, the output is 0. Okay, so the idea is we want to think of writing these cells as gates. They're on or they're off. And if you have gates, on, off gates, um, you're all computer, most of you are computer scientists, you know you can build um, devices like the computer that I'm using to uh, teach this lecture. Um, okay, let's look at this, uh, the squashing function first. Um, so the squashing function will take as input uh, the output of um, the linear regression layer, which is xi theta. So we have that eta is just x times theta, so that's the input. Um, and then the sigmoid function has this form. It's 1 over 1 plus e to the minus um, eta, its argument. And in particular, as eta goes to um, infinity, um, this function goes to 1, because this guy goes to 0. And uh, when that guy becomes very large, this function goes to 0. So it's either 0 or 1, it's between 0 and 1. Um, squashing it like this is nice because a function that's sort of between 0 and 1 we can now interpret this in, um, as a probability distribution so we're going to in fact we're going to um, for any xi theta any, uh, we're going to interpret this height between 0 and 1 as the probability that you belong to class 1 <coughs> So we're going to assume there are two possible classes. So the output variable here is either 0 or 1. In linear regression, the output was a continuous variable. And now it's either 0 or 1. And we're going to use this line to indicate the probability. So this is the model that we're constructing. We've, we, take x, we take x, we multiply times theta. That gives us a real number. Now we can't interpret that real number as a probability. And then to get uh, an equilibrated probability, what we're going to do is we're going to squash that x through this function that's going to map um, any number between minus infinity and infinity to the interval, um, I guess like this, 0, 1. Okay, so so that we can interpret the pi i as a as a probability. So the idea is um, this thing here is a probability that the output is one, given that particular input vector x i, and given its vector of parameters. So <coughs> each cell essentially think of the cell output of the cell as the probability um, if, of it being on. Okay, so that's the model. Um, now, if the probability of yi um, is equal to um, a sigmoid of xi theta, um, let's consider the following situation. Let's think of a 2D case. So we have some uh, data that consists of x1, x2 pairs, and then Y labels. And this might be 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, 0 0.71, etc. And this would be either 0 or 1. So we have points, two coordinates, x1 and x2, and then the label 0, 1. 
And so um, that's uh, what I'm showing you here. The blue points have the label y equals zero, and the red points have y equal one. And what I'm doing in this plot here is I'm just taking these 2D vectors, x1, x2, and I'm plotting. So each point here is uh, an x1, x2 pair. Okay, so my data is sort of two-dimensional points. Um, these points I know have a label associated with them, which is either red or blue. My task is how do I come up with this line? How do I compute this line? How do I compute a line that will separate blue from red automatically? And that's essentially the task that logistic regression will solve. Okay. The first thing is, we, I said we will get a line. And uh, to see that that's the case, note that um, Y will be 1, the label will be 1, or red in this case, if uh, the sigmoid um, so the probability that it's equal to 1 is the sigmoid of xi theta as we defined in the previous slide and I can actually in particular look at the um, look at this question when is that probability of it being 1 a half because that's the deciding point if the probability is a half I, above a half I will set the variable to 1. If the probability is below a half, I set the probability to 0. So I compute the probability and then based on that probability I decide whether the prediction should be a 1 or a 0. Um, but the point a half is the point at which um, I'm undecided between one or the other. But the sigmoid at, um, and so, so we need to see when is the sigmoid a half and that's a very simple calculation. A sigmoid is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus xi theta. And you, xi theta basically has to be 0, because then you get 1 plus 1. And so you get 1 over 2. So basically, requiring that the probability be a half is the same as saying uh, xi theta being 0. Because okay, remember that the argument, um, the argument of the sigmoid um, eta is um, xi theta. Okay. Having defined it this way, then we can see that the probability will be a half when you have the equation of a plane, xi theta, the implicit equation. So x1 times theta 1 plus x2 times theta 2 equals 0. That gives you this plane here, and so um, so we know that the decision boundary is a plane. But we haven't just computed this decision boundary, which, by the way, in machine learning we um, let me bring another color. In machine learning, we call this guy the discriminant. In this case, the discriminant is a linear function. Later, we will, by adding more layers in uh, next week, we will construct nonlinear boundaries. So we will be able to come up with very complex decisions that allow you to decide whether something is a cat or a dog. So that's a classical binary classification problem when you just see images. Um, but in addition to getting the discriminant, um, if instead of looking at the top view, we look at this view here, we actually see that we have this, again, the S-shaped curve in 2D, which has this form. And then um, this is the point of a half, this line here. Uh, the, in this case, the line is really a plane, so it's the intersection with that curve. And then all the points over here get assigned the label plus one. Um, plus one, um, all the points over here get assigned the label zero. Okay, because they, the probability is below 0.5. Okay, so that's the picture. So logistic regression is just linear regression followed by a squashing function that squashes the output between zero and one. Um, and if, if the probability of the output is 
greater than 0.5, we assign the point to class 1. If it's less than 0.5, we assign the, the point to class 0. And so our model is still um, intrinsically linear because the decision boundary is still linear, but now it has this extra, um, it has um, a function that we need to deal with. And so the question is, how do we learn theta now? And what can we say about learning theta? Is it easy? Is it hard? Um, before we look at that, um, let's quickly review something we did in, in lecture three. Um, so in lecture three, we introduced Bernoulli random variables. And a Bernoulli random variable basically is, the, is a model for a coin uh, flip. Um, the, the variable will, the probability of xi equal one is theta. The probability of xi equals zero is one minus theta. And so we came up with this very short notation of writing it. Um, if x is either one or zero, um, basically if x is equal to one, this term is one, and this term will be zero, so you would get theta only. And if x is uh, um, if x is zero, you get one minus theta. So this is just a nice way to summarize this table here. And so you have two values, theta and one minus theta, and you want um, and, and and then you just rewrite it in this type of form. This often gets no written as the Bernoulli distribution x over x with parameters theta. We also saw in that same class um, how to compute the entropy of a Bernoulli. And so if you plug in a Bernoulli into the expression for the entropy, which is negative p log p, um, we ended up with this expression here and we plotted it. And, and in particular, we notice that the entropy is maximum at the value 0.5. So when you really don't know whether the coin is going to be heads or tails, that's when you're very uncertain. If you know that the coin is loaded with a lot of lead so that most of the time it's heads, um, when I toss the coin and ask what it's going to be, you kind of know it's with high probability it's going to be heads. So there's little uncertainty in you predicting the future. Um, but if it's a half, then you have a maximum uncertainty in this case. Um, so entropy is a measure of uncertainty. Now, we need this cost of, in order to define um, the loss function. What we're trying to do in learning is minimize uncertainty. So once we can define uncertainty for the uh, uh, logistic regression model, we will have a mechanism of minimizing. We have, I just introduced the Bernoulli because um, whereas for linear regression, you were sort of you had these points in R, and so a Gaussian distribution made sense. Now, now the random variables are the, the predictions are the, are the zero or one. So the the random variables are is binary. So the right noise model for me to use is a Bernoulli model. The points are still independent. I'm still assuming that um, one point is not a function of a previous point. I'm assuming I have a data set of independent realizations. Um, because of that, then I know that the probability of all the outputs, given all the inputs, and this is just the same as in linear regression, um, is a pr product of Bernoulli's. Okay, so that's the only difference now. Um, and, and this here being the probability of yi given xi and theta. Okay. They're independent, so I multiply them over the data. N is an index over the data. And, um, and then I will just use the expression for a Bernoulli. Um, and in the logistic model that I formulated, I, per I s chose this quantity here, pi I, which I will call pi i, as the probability of yi being equal to 1 given xi and theta. That was my definition. It's a sigmoid that has as input xi and theta and then squashes it to be 0, uh, 1. Um, and then I defined 1 minus pi i 
which essentially is this guy here, 1 minus pi i, uh, is the probability of y i equals 0 given x i feet. Okay, that sort of makes sense. The two probabilities of i did being 0, 1 must add up to 1, um, and each probability is normalized so it's between 0 and 1. Um, and this is something we will do a lot. We're essentially doing composition. Um, we start by having a linear model x theta, and then we're going to do we'll feed it through this um, squashing function, this uh, Bernoulli uh, squashing function, and we will use that to construct a probability model. And in fact, the, the type of probability distributions we need are very few. You know, the sort of Gaussian, Bernoulli, Poisson. Uh, but because we always are able to use compositions of functions, we can build very, very complex uh, probability distributions. Okay, so, and, and then of course you can see that if yi is zero, if an observation has label zero, um, you have that the prediction, this guy, oops, sorry. This, if it's zero, this guy will go to one, and this guy disappears, and so you you get essentially this. You get this. That's a probability of y being equal to zero is one minus pi i. Um, so that's how we formulate the probability, and just as we did for linear regression, and I said we should always do it to get the fun, to get a cost that we need to optimize. Uh, we just going to do the negative log likelihood. So the cost that we will optimize by doing gradient descent or any of the techniques we discussed last week um, is going to be to look at the negative log of p of y given x and theta. And if we do the negative log, we get negative sum from i equal 1 to n y i log of pi i plus 1 minus y i log of 1 minus pi i. Okay, so this is called the cross entropy. or the entropy between y and pi. So we're minimizing the uncertainty. So it's not surprising. We get something that is actually very reasonable. Um, we formulate our probabilistic model. We use the laws of probability of independence. Um, we defined the model so that these probabilities make uh, sense, so that we take sum to 1, so that they're between 0 and 1. And when we take logs and differentiate and, equate, uh, and differentiate, we get um, actually, we haven't differentiated yet. We take just logs, rewrite it, we get the entropy. So we're going to minimize uncertainty. That kind of tells us we're on the right track. Um, you could, in fact, have skipped all the probability. And if you, like, in fact, if you're a phys physicist and so on, you often think in terms of entropies and costs. So you would have gone straight to write the cost. This is the cost that I want to optimize and you would just write down that cost. So if any of the probability confused you, um, imagine that just this is what you need to know. You need to know how to formulate a cost. You need to need to know how to formulate uncertainty and then minimize that. The rest is mechanical, and I'm not going to go over it in much detail, um, but essentially you, um, you will go over it in detail because this is your next um, exercise for your class. Um, I'm going to ask you to do, uh, do the, the, just do differentiation and then you will get the Jacobian. Um, you'll, get, you'll get to see there is a nice closed form for the gradient and then there's also a very nice closed form for the Hessian, for the matrix of second derivatives. Um, and then you will have to show that this Hessian is positive definite, okay, has positive eigenvalues, um, and that gives it a nice, nice curvature. Um, and in particular, it makes the problem convex, so you know that there's that, uh, so that you can solve it exactly. 
at up to numeric precision. You still will be doing optimization, but you will be able to solve this exactly. And you get the optimal solution. Uh, one way to optimize, yeah, in fact, if you've done the practical, you already uh, tried a few ways to optimize this um, on the torch. But uh, let me tell you what the, the, the classical way of doing this with a Newton method is we have an expression for the gradient, we have an expression for the Hessian, so we just plug them into this expression. And uh, when, when you actually look at the literature, people often don't write this, call this a Newton method, but they call it a reweighted least squares problem. And I'm not going to go into this, but in a sense, if you think about it, this looks just like uh, what we had before for least squares, x transpose x inverse. And so we're just weighting this, uh, these matrix x transpose x with this uh, matrix and uh, diagonal matrix in between s. And that's why it, it gets this name. The, the solution itself, the updates are like least squares updates. All right, so there's two ways um, to think of logistic uh, uh, regression. Um, one way is um, just get my. One way is to think of it as um, you have you have an input x1 and an input x2 all the way up to xd, each of these inputs are multiplied by a parameter. Um, the, one of these is always set to 1. So again, to give you the, um, just like for linear regression, you still need to move the line up and down. So you need a bias term, uh, theta 1. So it's like when you added that column of 1s to your x matrix. Um, Torch will do this automatically for you. Um, and then out you get the vector x times theta, and then that goes into another neuron, which is a squashing neuron, and out you get 1 over 1 plus e to the minus x theta. Okay. So that's uh, one way to, um, to think of this. Um, the way we are going to do it that is a bit more general that will allow us to go to more classes instead of just doing binary classification you might want to classify for example pixels um, you know be able to classify something into um, I don't know small medium large three three categories um, and this will or maybe you read numbers you want to say whether they're a zero one or two or three or or, or digit nine um, and so the way we're going to um, generalize this is we're going to write the model slightly differently. We're going to write this as x1, x2, all the way up to xd. But we're going to add extra neurons. So we're going to have two linear neurons. Now, let, let me put an index over the data here. So i is an index over the data. And let me just call all this xi. I'm sort of overloading here. Let's do it this way. So I have a vector of the dimensional vector. And so I'm going to just say that that vector is um, the dimensional vector of inputs. And they could be real numbers, or they could, in fact, be categorical zero ones, and so on. It doesn't matter. Any subset of R D. Um, so once again, I have my linear neurons, and then I'm going to put this into something called a softmax. And what I'm going to get out is two outputs. And then the outputs are going to be e to the xi theta 1 over e to the xi theta 1 plus e to the xi theta 2. 
and I'm gonna call this pi i1 and I'm gonna get as well e to the xi theta 2 divided by e to the xi theta 1 plus e to the xi theta 2 and I'm going to call this pi i 2 okay. so in this model what I'm doing differently and of course there, there's still parameters here so there's theta 1 1 um, this will be theta d2 and so on all the parameters that are associated with this guy I'm gonna put them in a vector theta 1 so theta 1 will be like theta 1 1 all the way to theta 1 d so there are d, d parameters that go in there this is we'll say to 1 and I do the same thing for theta 2 so the output here then is xi times theta 1 and the output here is xi times theta 2 so they basically I'm taking the vector theta 1 and multiplying by the vector of inputs and I'm outputting the dot product of xi theta so it's a linear neuron as before and then I have another neuron but that has parameters theta 2 where theta 2 is equal to theta um, uh, theta 2 1 all the way up to theta 2 d and I guess I should have written this one as 2 d so it's a d-dimensional vector of parameters um, now in the reason why we're going to do this formulation is because um, the way I'm doing it, um, it would it would be very easy for me to just add more outputs and just call it pi i1, pi i2, pi i3, and I can define them using this expression. Because um, you can easily see that pi i1 plus pi i2 is equal to 1. The way I'm defining them, um, if I because if I add the numerators I basically get the denominator um, they will sum to one so if I had more terms if I had three terms the denominator would have three terms where I sum all the numerators so everything will still sum to one um, and then um, it, it's also trivial to convince yourself you can, you can go home that this function is between zero and one um, so we have probability so that's, this is just another way of making sure that each output is between 0 and 1 which is what we want um, essentially because the same guy appears at the bottom here and at the top and all the exponentials are positives um, and once you know that each term is between 0 and 1 um, and you know that when you add them they sum to 1 we've just came up with a different way of representing probabilities just an alternative to the logistic. The logistic was only give outputting, the network would only output the probability of class 1. Now we're basically outputting the probability of class 1 and also the probability of class 0. It, it seems redundant in, the, in this case. We sort of have, because once you know the probability of class 1, you know that the probability of class 0 is just 1 minus the probability of class 1. Um, so we're, we're doing it a little bit redundant, but it will allow us to sort of uh, write more efficient code in scale. Okay, so what we're going to do next is just write it for this particular model, we're going to write the likelihood. Uh, we're then going to look at the cost function corresponding to that likelihood, and then we will differentiate it and check that we get the same answers as with the original formulation of um, that didn't involve the softmax function, but that involved the um, this thing called a logistic function. And this is just a softmax. So the softmax is just a way you exponentiate uh, one of, if you have two inputs, you take e to the one input divided by the sum of e to the other, or of all the inputs.
Okay, I need to introduce some notation, which again, it's a little bit redundant for the binary case, but it's essentially if, for you to go and understand the, when you have more classes. So it will be important when we deal with, say, three classes in, in next week. Um, so an indicator variable of the set C, um, this guy here, it's just a variable that it's one if the argument is precisely C, and otherwise it's zero. So, okay. It's just one way of checking whether the variable Yi is equal to C. If it's equal to C, um, the output is one. If it's not equal to C, the output is zero. Um, so this will turn out to be uh, a convenient way of writing things. Um, Okay, so once we have this, uh, we can now write again the probability of y, x, and theta. The points are still independent, and there are n data points. And now we just need to write the model, and then the probability of uh, class 1 is just pi i1 so this should be pi i1 and I've defined class 1 to be related to uh, class 0 so we're gonna write this as i 0 y i and then times pi i 2 i1 of y i and it's the same as before. So in particular, um, in particular note that P of Yi equal uh, to one given Xi comma theta would be pi I one. And then if Yi is equal to one, I would have zero here times pi i2, and if y i equal to 1, I would get the 1 here, and that's equal to pi i2. Likewise, the probability of pi y equal to 0 Okay, and we know from the previous slide that pi i1 and pi i2 sum to 0. Sorry, sum to 1. Okay, so um, so we have a way of writing the likelihood and it's very similar to what we had before. Um, if we take now the negative log likelihood, oops, so that's our likelihood and um, if we now take um, the derivative to get the cost, we will get just as before this the sum from one to n of i zero y i log of pi i one plus i one y i log of pi i2 which is again the cross entry so we're still minimizing the cross entry we've just changed the way in which we parameterize the probability of class 1 and the probability of class 2 but this new way is still a valid parameterization because it satisfies the property that the pi's are between 0 and 1 and when you sum them they sum to 1 Okay, so the, the next thing we would like to answer is um, how do we uh, optimize this? How do we find the optimal thetas? Um, and to do that, we need to come up with uh, equations for the derivatives. So in particular, I'm going to focus on like, finding the derivative for the parameters, um, the vector of parameters theta 2. So once I know my vector of derivatives, I know how to optimize. I can just follow gradient descent. Um, stochastic gradient descent or a synchronous gradient descent if I have many machines I can do all sorts of things but 
the game is really computing derivatives. Once we know derivatives, um, the rest is easy. The re um, well, relatively easy. You, you, then you have to solve the optimization problem. Okay. Um, we're going to take one more step. So we represented a neural network as, um, and I'm already using the word network here. And if you think of each of these units as um, a node and a graph, um, there is initial, you, I'm going to sort of give names to these modules and I'm going to call them layers. So at first we have a linear layer, which is that linear regression, and then we have the softmax layer, and that spits out the output. Um, now, when I look at my loss, my loss essentially um, computes the predictions, and uh, pi i1 and pi i2, and then applies this cross entropy function to produce the cost. So I can think of the cost function as another layer. A layer that takes as input pi i1 and pi i2 and outputs c of theta. So in effect I have to get to the cost I need to compute through three layers of computation. Okay, so in other words I have my, my vector x I put it into a linear layer I get two things. I get x times theta 1, x times theta, oops, theta 1. Let's get rid of that. Okay. I'm going to do something now slightly different. Instead of using a softmax layer, I'm going to start using something called the log softmax layer. And that's just the log of a softmax. It turns out that it makes some of the calculations easier and is what you're using in Torch. So I'm just going to do that change. You could do everything without the log, but the log will just make things easy. So what's a log softmax? It's the log of a softmax. So pi is a softmax, this is a log softmax. Or for short, I'm going to call it the LSF function. Okay, so this is the log softmax layer, and then uh, out of this log softmax layer, I, la I get log of pi one, log of pi two. And then that goes into the negative log likelihood layer, which is just this cross entropy layer. Once I have pi 1 and pi 2, I can compute C of theta. And so my output here is C of theta. Okay, so we're going to think of this in terms of layers. And that's going to be critical for how we design algorithms that compute the gradient sufficiently. Because we, we end up doing all our calculations layer-wise. In fact, when we code our models, we're not going to code entire models, but we will code layers. And then assembling networks is just a question of putting layers together. And you can build them in a sequence like I'm doing now, but we'll actually be able to create all sorts of arbitrary graphs and topologies and so on. And this, this, this modular architecture, modular mod way of writing code and, uh, and doing uh, the, co the computing that is, I think, one of the reasons, one of the reasons behind the recent revolution in, in deep learning is people are able to, people have very flexible tools like Torch, like Berkeley's Cafe to build models and test them.